Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of the highest quality woven guitar, bag, and camera straps you'll ever see. Native Sons straps are handmade one at a time in the USA with unparalleled love and care. Click the link in the description to check out their new expanded lineup featuring all new 3-inch guitar straps. And remember, when you support my sponsor, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hey, y'all. It's She's Supposed to Friday. Hey, how's it going, good and sexy people? Brad the Guitar just here, and it's time again for another episode of Shitpost Friday. First up, this Shitpost Friday, as usual, I like to get the sad news out of the way first, and this is indeed sad news. Robert Hunter, uh, the Grateful Dead lyricist, is dead at the age of 78. Wrote some lyrics for a couple Bob Dylan albums as well. Uh, he actually joined Jerry Garcia in 2015 in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and he will certainly be sorely missed. Also, a couple weeks back, uh, something I missed, actually, um, Daniel Johnston had passed away, and I didn't realize it, so I didn't really get to give Daniel Johnston a proper send-off on this channel. Daniel Johnston was a just a really quirky uh, songwriter. Uh, he had, like, kind of a schizoaffective disorder. I forget exactly what his diagnosis was, but he was kind of, kind of a crazy dude. He uh, was born in West Virginia, lived uh, in Austin, Texas. He got his big break or early 1990s. In 1990, I think he went up to a like a showcase in New York City, and he was supposed to play some shows with Sonic Youth and stuff. And he like ended up taking some acid and like just went off the rails completely. Kind of sort of lost his mind and he was kind of not all there to begin with but i think the acid sort of pushed him over the edge and he was one of those songwriters who uh just did things in a really childlike manner just really lo-fi he distributed all, all of his early material on tapes and all, he got his message out there about his music through sheer word of mouth and sheer persistence uh in fact people uh, would actually visit him at work because he worked at a mcdonald's and they would, like, fans of his would just show up at the McDonald's where he, like, did the most menial tasks possible, like wiping tables. And <laughs> so, they, so they would go in there, like, to meet their idol, you know, their kind of, uh, their kind of rock star who would wipe down the tables at the McDonald's. And so he came, became, like, a cult hero, sort of, of the uh, uh, underground songwriter movement. Uh, the 90s is when I probably got turned on to him, uh, like a lot of other people, in fact, because uh, Kurt Cobain wore one of his shirts uh, during, I think, an interview or something, and uh, it just kind of, you know, went viral in the way that uh, things could go viral in the 90s, I think, through people seeing it on MTV. And, you know, he just had, like, tons and tons of albums, tons of material that he, he would record constantly. It just has a really weird, quirky life. You guys have got to see this documentary on him. It's called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. You can actually see it if you have or have a Prime membership, Amazon Prime. You can see it for free on Amazon Prime. But just a really interesting character. He had this... Uh, muse that he wrote songs about like from the time he was uh, a teenager in the 80s like all the way through to pretty much the day he died he was writing songs uh, of this unrequited love that he had for this uh, girl that he met in art school that he just he only kind of roughly even knew you know and just in his mind he built her up as this kind of goddess and he would write all these songs about her and stuff there was this also the story about him he was in an airplane i think with his dad um, I'm trying to remember the story now because it's been a while since I saw the documentary, so I'm not sure how exactly this went. But he was coming back. I think his dad had flown to pick him up because he spent time in and out of mental institutions like his whole life, pretty much. And uh, that he went to pick him up in his, in his airplane, and he was flying back or something. And Daniel like grabbed the controls of the airplane, and they actually crashed the airplane. I think both of them ended up surviving, but they survived this plane crash. So they both should have really it should have killed them. Uh, just a really just a weird character. Uh, definitely worth a watch if you guys can uh, see this documentary on him. Uh, but yeah, just really sad that people like this are starting to drop off. You know, we need more characters and like this in the world not less speaking of weirdness uh i thought this was a really weird story somebody sent me this and it's just uh kind of infuriating in a way kind of happy in a way but fifty four thousand dollars worth of guitars get donated to this anchorage alaska school district because they had been confiscated by fish and wildlife uh, service in the u.s uh, what had happened is uh, these guitars were being shipped 
uh, from one dealer to another who was outside the United States, who was actually in Hong Kong. So uh, before they actually left the, the final port of exit out of the United States, they were confiscated by Fish and Wildlife. And why? Because they had Brazilian rosewood in the guitars. Well, the Anchorage School District got a pleasant surprise earlier this month when the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife donated a set of electric guitars to the school district. Mike, Beth, these guitars aren't some cheap plastic ones you might expect to find at a school. They're handcrafted, unique guitars made out of Brazilian rosewood, a wood you can't normally make guitars out of anymore. Owen Pardoon plays guitar in the West High Jazz Band. And this new guitar is changing his sound. It feels a lot more easier for me to play than uh, my Stratocaster. That's just one of 10 Paul Reed Smith guitars donated to the Anchorage School District. 10 guitars with a very unique history. And they were sold to a dealer and sold to another dealer who then tried to ship them overseas. But because they have rosewood in them, you can't do that without special permission. And these guitars did not have that permission. So on the way to Hong Kong, they were seized by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, brought back to this port of entry. And so they sent me an email asking if we might be interested. And they were interested. The guitars were given to all of the high schools in the district. In our jazz programs, kids, high school kids will get to use them and we'll, we hope to have some absolutely rockin' jazz bands because of it. They're worth quite a bit of money. The retail value is uh, $54,000. But it's hard to put a price on the memories they'll make. Well, now they don't have to fret about not having a good guitar to play, right? These are not your average Paul Reed Smiths either. These are like the 10 top, these are very high-end Paul Reed Smiths. A combined total of $54,000. I'm sure that was a very, very bad day for whoever uh, forgot to fill out the CITES paperwork on that one. But that's what I keep saying to you guys, man. A lot of you guys are like, I've been shipping them without the CITES paperwork. Uh, I, that is the most ill-advised thing you could possibly do is ship a guitar without the proper international paperwork or try to circumvent import duties or any of that stuff. You know, if you do that, you're kind of doing that at your own risk. I mean, a lot of people, when they buy stuff from you, are going to ask you, yeah, can you say that it costs this or can you do this or can you, you know, you know, lie on this paperwork or whatever. I mean, you got to be real careful about this, guys, as as this story should tell you. I'm not saying I agree with the confiscation necessarily of these instruments. You know, I think uh, the instruments obviously had, had already had paperwork on the wood that they were built with, of course, because they were built by a reputable builder and they had the paperwork already. So why you would have to get a second bit of paperwork is beyond me and is absolutely freaking ridiculous. But you know, that's uh, apparently not the letter of the law, so they confiscate these things and uh, these schools get the benefit of having all these guitars in Anchorage, Alaska. Now they, like, every guitarist in that whole entire school district apparently has a very high-end Paul Reed Smith to play now. But somebody really lost their ass on this one. Also in guitar news, we have reached the end of the Boaz One Kickstarter campaign, and it looks like it's been a very successful one. Boaz has raised $445,000. That's almost a half a million dollars toward uh, launching the Boaz One uh, modular guitar. Uh, you guys who follow my channel uh, probably are well aware I interviewed Boaz in this very room uh, not all that long ago and just had a really long, really interesting uh, very stimulating conversation with Boaz and his uh, cohort Morris and uh, it was just a real pleasure to meet both of them and you know I'm, I'm grateful now to be able to call both of them friends and uh, it's it's just really gratifying to have been a part of this sort of uh, Kickstarter thing from the beginning you know they even use my video in their Kickstarter campaign. If you scroll down on Kickstarter, you can still see my video listed there. So, it, you know, they have smashed through their $20,000 goal that they had set for themselves initially, uh, and then some. Boaz has also announced that he's going to be uh, hand signing and hand numbering all of the uh, guitars that are produced as a result of this Kickstarter campaign. Uh, so they should be collectibles, you know, in the future. Boaz is not just known for this guitar, guys. This guy, He is a legendary acoustic guitar luthier and builder. You should really research the guy. I had I did not do my homework before he came here. And I just, it started to dawn on me who this guy was who was in, in this room with me. I was like, you're that guy. It's like, I know, I've 
seen your work. You know, it's like I, I know of your innovations, you know. It, you know, anybody who's ever played a guitar where that has a, a hole on the side of the guitar facing upward toward the, you know, toward the player, that hole is often called the Boaz sound hole because he sort of pioneered that. If you're thinking about getting one of these things in the waning hours of this Kickstarter campaign, please use the link down below. That will give me a little bit of a kickback uh, for this channel. And as always, best of luck to Boaz. Someone sent me a link to this the other day, uh, and I thought it was kind of interesting. This guy on this effectslayouts.blogspot.com website has reverse engineered the Steel Panther Pussy Melter pedal, and he has the uh, diagrams and the layouts where you can actually build your own if you want to sort of paint by numbers and put one of these things together yourself. I will put a link down in the description uh, where you can go and, and get these plans to build yourself a pussy melter. So if you missed out on the original pussy melter, you'll at least be able to build yourself one of these. Elsewhere in the world of guitar, a BB King Lucille prototype guitar has sold at auction for $280,000. And Getty Lee will be auctioning off a few of his guitars coming up soon. And he's got quite the collection. He will be auctioning off six really impressive guitars. He's got a 59 Gibson Les Paul Standard that's going to be going to auction. He's got a 1960 ES345, which looks just really clean. He's got a 55 Stratocaster, which once again looks exceptionally clean. Looks like it's a ash body. 1960 335 with the block inlays. Really snazzy looking Bigsby on there as well. Uh, 1965 ES335 is also uh, with the later trim on that one. And a 1967 uh, Gibson Flying V reissue. Those will be going to auction uh, uh, at Meckham Auctions in Las Vegas on October the 10th through the 12th. So it'll be interesting to see what those bring. I thought this was a really neat story as well. This guy named Jeff Curtis went to a Led Zeppelin concert in 1972. And for whatever reason, he found himself after the show kind of hanging out around the stage and, and sort of helping, helping the roadies lo load equipment in and out. And as he's about to say goodbye to them all, the guy says, hey, you can have that right there, and points to a guitar case that's sitting there. And it's the actual guitar case that Jimmy Page's Les Paul originally came in. So it's the original case for Jimmy's Les Paul. You can see it here. It's all taped up. Apparently the thing had suffered a, uh, some kind of catastrophic you know, damage to it and they were gonna throw it away anyway. This is, just happened to be the, the night that they were gonna throw it in the dumpster. They had already gotten a new case for Jimmy Page's uh, number one Les Paul. It was like an anvil case that they were gonna put it in and they were gonna throw this thing in the garbage and they just gave it to this dude and this dude uh, just recently got in touch with Jimmy Page after he went to the Play It Loud exhibit that we talked about in another Shitpost Friday. Uh, so he, what he did, he went to this Play It Loud exhibit and he sees Jimmy's number one there and he's thinking to himself, you know, I'd like to get that case back with this guitar back in the hands of Jimmy Page. And he contacts the museum staff, the curator of, of the actual show, and through him gets in touch somehow with Jimmy Page and arranges to meet him and to give him back this case. Uh, he sits down with Jimmy for about an hour or so and they talk and he opens the case and Jimmy's like, yeah, man, that really brings back a lot of memories and, you know, thanks him for bringing it back to him and he signs some stuff for him and gives him like, uh, you know, a Led Zeppelin box set and uh, just, just a really cool story, you know, and a really cool experience that this guy got to have because he was, you know, generous enough to give back this case, which probably would have been worth many 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 thousands of dollars I, i'm i would be really interested to, to know what actually that case would bring at an auction it would probably be the most expensive guitar case ever sold if it sold at an auction uh, that would just be my guess because i mean you can even see it it has led zeppelin stenciled on it and you know he has he has good provenance uh you know jimmy himself even acknowledged it's uh, it's his case you know so I'm just, I'm wondering how much it would have been worth. But this guy, you know, I mean, obviously he's not worried about that. He just wanted to be able to meet Jimmy Page, get this case back in his hands, who he considered to be the rightful owner to begin with. It was given to him, but just a really, really interesting story. And I would, I'd like to know from you guys, what, what would you have done in this situation? You know, you're sitting on 
a piece of rock and roll history. You have Jimmy Page's uh, actual case for his number one Les Paul in your possession. Uh, you know, you got it directly from uh, the Led Zeppelin road crew. They were going to throw it away anyway. What would you do in this? W would you would you sell it at auction and give the money to your kids? Uh, or, you know, split it between your kids and a charity? Or would you give it all to charity? What would you do with this? It, this... Uh, gift that this guy had been given. I'd like to hear your comments down below. All right, that's going to do it for the news. All right, now it's time for Ask an Amp Tech. When you don't know what the fuck you're doing, don't go ask an Amp Tech. Okay, this week on Ask an Amp Tech, we're going to hear from Doug Rowland, who writes... I have a 93 concert amp and I saw your video on YouTube. I made a video not long ago about uh, this, this amp. This is my main amp for about 10 years. I only use the clean channel. Uh, Ken had to patch it up a few times over the years. Anyway, it got to where it would swap channels on its own. Uh, and actually now it's stuck on the gain channel. Uh, I've wondered would it be impossible to gut the PCB and build a single channel circuit using existing transformers tubes etc maybe impossible or stupid i don't know uh, but i've seen you at least work on uh and may have a little insight either way thanks for your time yeah let's take a look at the schematic on this thing all right looking at the schematic there's really one, only one area here on the schematic that we're concerned with and that's the switching matrix and that is right in this area here you can see the foot switch jack that comes in and ties into all of this circuitry over here we have uh, a few different 4560 ic's here we have one two three four of those things uh, the main one we're concerned with, the main area of this switching matrix we're going to be concerned with, is the area around the U2B IC. The whole line that uh, has that on it, we're going to be looking at those components because it's probably one of these components has failed. And let's kind of go through these components one at a time and I'll tell you why it could be this these components. The, we have a couple of diodes, first of all. We have a regular silicone diode, then we have a Zener diode. Uh, either one of those, if they were to fail, or they were to short, or anything like that, could uh, actually bleed off the voltage that is supposed to be present on that line right there to ground. Those could be at fault, so check those. Then there's a 0.22 capacitor uh, right there. Uh, at 63 volts and if that capacitor is failed if it's actually allowing you know current to flow to ground that could reduce the available voltage there for that IC and basically uh, make that IC shut off uh, so that would be definitely something to look at uh, then you got the IC itself and then over here you have uh, C56 if you see right above C56 this is a 22 microfarad 63 volt capacitor and if you look right above it, there's 16 volts that is supposed to be present right there at that point. And if that capacitor fails, that could screw up the voltages over there. You've also got your relay right there in parallel with that. Uh, and that relay could also be at fault. That's a potential uh, faulty component. Uh, but any one of these components uh, are the ones that I would look for first. Now you can also check the, the resistors right here. You've got R84 and you've got R92, uh, R84 probably being the other prime suspect um, that might be at fault. You got a feedback resistor here at R82 that could also be potentially an issue. That's a one meg. Um, but really the circled components that I have circled here are the most likely ones. And you could see here on the layout diagram uh, where they are located on the actual PCB. Uh, so hopefully that will help you try to locate those and to test them. And uh, if you find a fault with one of them, then uh, go ahead and replace it. You may also, if you choose to, I mean, if you want to save yourself some time, uh, it might even be might even be wise to go ahead and order those components and just replace them all, just shotgun all of those. You know, make sure that you observe the polarity, you know, of course, on the diodes and things like that. Make sure you put 
uh, don't burn your you know, PCB board or anything like that either. Uh, but this is something that you could do if you want to try to do this yourself and if you want to look into this yourself. I would not recommend trying to take the PCB out of this thing and make it into like a single channel amplifier just simply because uh, the amp as it is, if you could get it going with minimal effort, uh, you could probably even take that thing and get it get it working again and then just sell it uh, and get some decent money out of it I would imagine because uh, you know like I said I've did I've done a video on them and uh, you know I mean I, I think they could bring pretty decent money if you were to try to sell it then you could just flip that one and then buy yourself the single channel amp that you want that way it, it save you all that time and effort and there are plenty of good single channel amps already out there without having to you know sort of destroy this one or mo heavily modify it so that's what I would recommend so uh, yeah hope that helps you out when you don't know what the fuck you'll do with your Alright, that'll do it for this shit post Friday. I hope you guys have enjoyed this one. If you have, hit subscribe down below. Hit the bell to receive all notifications. Share this uh, widely if you don't mind. These shit post Fridays take a lot of time to produce. And uh, YouTube, for whatever reason, they're not sending these out like they used to. So I'd appreciate it if you share this around. And for now, y'all take care.